Hello everybody, this is Danny from Deep South Homestead. We are here today, uh, it's that time of the year. Things are starting to cool down a little bit in the mornings. Uh, the leaves are all falling off the trees and it makes us think about fall. And when we think about fall, we think about uh, the rendering of lard. And we have here, actually we have four of these, but this is two of our batches of lard that we got uh, from the slaughterhouse and we are going to be rendering it down and hopefully showing y'all the process um, of the best way we've learned over the years to do this. Now, there's basically three types of fat on a hog. There's back fat, belly fat, and kidney fat, or leaf fat as it's called, around the kidneys. Each one has its own distinct flavor, its own distinct taste, and its own use. Um, the, the back fat is going to be the strongest tasting fat. It's going to be one that's going to render out somewhat darker than the belly fat or than the leaf fat. Uh, the back fat is usually best used for things like frying chicken or something other like that, um, deep frying stuff. It, uh, it will have a little bit stronger taste to it but some people actually prefer that. Then you have what's called the belly fat. Now the belly fat is usually what's left on the bacon uh, because the bacon is cut from the sides of the hog in the midland area. And that fat is usually left for bacon purposes. Very few people ever cut that off of a hog and use it for anything other than the bacon fat because it seems to season out well. It ends up when you cure the bacon, it smokes well. Uh, it just, it's just a very good tasting fat in with the bacon on the hog at that point. Then you have what's called leaf fat or kidney fat. It's a fat that's inside the hog, inside the cavity of the hog, all up around the kidneys in there. And there's usually not a tremendous amount of this fat, usually just a few pounds per pig. And this is the favored fat of the animal because when this is rendered properly, it makes the best pastries that you can, that you can make or the best biscuits or anything, pie crusts and things like this, tarts and different things because it's so flaky and if rendered right, it renders out snow white and it's just really smooth, it has a good texture, and it's easy to work with. Now, when you get ready to use your lard, if you wanna take time to, uh, to cut it all up and keep it separate, um, I would advise doing it. Now, what we have here is all back fat. We don't have any belly fat because it's all went toward bacon. So this is all back fat. There, as far as I know, there's no leaf fat in this, um, just simply because it's such a prized fat to keep in the slaughterhouses and sold. So this will be rendered down and be used mainly for like if a person wanted to uh, to deep fry something or you know to, or, or that for that reason, I guess you might say. Now when you do this, one of the best procedures, if you want the most out of your fat, what you want to do is to let it kind of half thaw. And if you don't have a meat grinder yourself, you can ask the butcher to do this. Just let the butcher run it through a coarse plate meat grinder. Uh, we have a 3 16 hole and we have a 1 8 inch hole and we probably would run it through the 3 16 and grind it up because when you grind it, Rendering is a lot easier. It takes less time and you usually end up getting more lard from what you're rendering. So I would advise if there's any way possible, because it's impossible to cut it by hand very small um, to make it extremely efficient. So either grind it yourself through a 3 16 inch plate or let the butcher do it for you. Now, one of the things that you want to know before you actually start doing this, and now we're going to do it in the house just simply because it takes a lot of gas if you're out on a burner to run a burner all day long because 
Rendering lard is a very long process. It's not anything that's just going to happen real quick. Because the secret to, to good lard is cooking it at a very low temperature. If you get in a hurry and you start trying to cook it too fast, you can actually scorch it, uh, or what they call burn it, and then you have an off flavor in it. Plus it makes for a very dark brown looking lard. And uh, to me, that's not the best tasting lard out there. A grass fed pig, um, studies have shown, is extremely high in omega-3s. If it's allowed to free range and eat tubers and roots and grass and all these types of things, um, his fat is said, it's actually said to be higher than some cold water fish. Um, now I'm not a scientist and I haven't done actually done the studies on it. I just know that that's what um, research is showing is that um, especially the leaf fat of the pig up around the kidneys and all is uh, actually better for you. Now, that, with that being said, um, you want to be extremely careful when you're rendering out lard because you want to cook it extremely slow because, like I said in the beginning, if you start cooking it too fast, what you end up with, especially with the, with the back fat like this, and the belly fat to an extent, if you decide to grind it, is you get a piggy taste in it. Uh, it's what they call, it, it tastes like a pig. And you want to make sure that you, that you render it extremely slow. Now we're, like I said, well, we're not gonna be using the, uh, uh, the gas burners outside because it just takes too long. We're gonna be using the slow cookers that we have, uh, crock pots and stuff like that to go ahead and get this rendered down and get it rendered down pretty quick. And we'll be storing it in jars um, so that we have it for long term. We'll let it seal and um, it'll keep that way for quite some time, especially if you go ahead and get the freezer type jars where you can just stack them in the freezer. Then you don't have to worry about it for extended lengths of time. Now what you want to do is when you're actually rendering this lard out is, um, uh, is you want to cook it extremely slow till you hear it begin to, they call it off-gassing. Um, when you hear the, the fat starting to actually crackle and pop inside the grease, then you know you're getting very close to the end of the cooking process. And don't be, uh, don't get in a hurry and don't try to turn it up. You really want to start, if you're using a stove, you want to start on maybe three to start with to kind of get your pot kind of heated up and then you want to turn it to low and just leave it. But when we use the crock pots, we'll just set them on its low setting. Um, that way we can just leave it for quite some time. And there's a few things that you want to really take into consideration when you're doing this is fat gets extremely hot. I mean, very hot when it's uh, rendering. Uh, my recommendation, I don't know that this is uh, anything, any kind of proof behind it or anything like that, but it's just, it's a, just a Danny recommendation, is that you use a wooden spoon. I don't, I don't uh, advise using plastics or anything like that because this, this oil is so hot. You have to be careful if you get it on you, it would burn you. So I would advise using a wooden spoon of some sort uh, I wouldn't use metal, I would use wood to kind of keep it, because you don't have to stir it constantly. You want to kind of just let it sit, but every so often you want to come by and you want to kind of stir it, and what that does is, is it takes the, the uh, part of the lard that's on the bottom and kind of roll it up on top so that the, what's on the bottom doesn't overcook. And you kind of want to every, just so, every so often just come through and just kind of a little gentle stir, moving it around, so that it all cooks evenly. Now, uh, what's, what's left after this process? This, I, I got into a lot of discussion about this because a few years ago I did a video on making pork skins. There is a difference in cracklings and pork skins. Cracklings are not made from pork skins. Crackling, true cracklings are made 
from left of, what's left over of the fat and little pieces of the actual meat that's in with the fat. Uh, it's a byproduct of it. Once you get through cooking it and everything's rendered down, uh, there's actually presses that you can buy to take the uh, what's left over once you drain all the grease out of it and the pieces of bits that's left, you can actually put them in a piece of cheesecloth and put them in this uh, press and you can press it down and it presses any remaining oil out of it and what's left, that's called cracklings. Now as a kid growing up, those were prized with us. I mean, mom made crackling cornbread, uh, you could she keep cracklings in little paper bags sitting around. You could you could go and um, you could just reach in and get your piece of crackling and, and, and eat on it, and it was just it was so good, guys. It was just crunchy, um, had that real just fatty flavor with actually no fat in it, believe it or not, um, and it was just fantastic. Made the best cornbread in the world. Um, I'd probably eat a half a pickup bed load in my life, I reckon. Um, it's it's just they're just it's just has the best taste to me that's just some of the information about rendering lard that i thought i would throw out there to start with um it's really high in a lot of uh, minerals and vitamins and stuff like that but omega-3s from the grass fed is really probably the best uh advice i can give you on if you can get if you got an heirloom pig it's really a good grass feeder now this right here is not going to be, um, I already know this one's not going to be high in omega-3s and all that kind of stuff. They're here at Deep South Homestead, we just wanted something to put in storage for backup in case we couldn't get lard or anything. Um, something was to happen uh, on LCE before we actually got one of our pigs butchered or something like that. Uh, we, want, we just like to have storage and we like to have backup and that's why we're doing it. And we won't put it in the small containers because small containers are best because you don't really use a lot of lard at one time like we don't we use very small amounts of uh, even the coconut oil we use um we probably don't use a pint every two to three weeks um so we don't use much at all and with the lard we probably would use even less than that so uh, we would probably put it in pint or half pint containers um, to store it in and like I said, you want to make sure the freezer's safe because really the best way to store this is in the freezer. Um, it can be stored on a shelf out, but the freezer is the longest term storage that you're going to get. So anyway, guys, once we get this thawed out a little bit, we're going to take it and put it in the grinder. And after we grind it, we're going to put it in them pots and we're going to get this show on the road. Alright guys, we're back in the kitchen. We've got our fat that has been run through a grinder and it did pretty good. I'm okay with that. That gets it where, like Danny said, it would take um, less time to cook. If you put it in the big chunks or you sit and take time to slice it up, whichever way you have to do it. But we had a grinder. We used it. Okay, we're going to be dueling pots here. Both of them are kasori. Okay, this is the Kasori pressure cooker. I am not pressuring this, so we're taking this lid off. This one, this pressure cooker comes with a stainless bowl, which is really awesome. I like the stainless, and we're gonna see how stainless works in the pressure cooker. Now, here we have the multi-cooker from Kasori. This pot, 
I said it before it was Teflon coated. It's not Teflon. They said it is a water uh, based coating of some sort, but it looks like Teflon. It's, it's actually a non-stick surface. So for whatever reason, it is not Teflon, but it is a non-stick surface. So we're going to be using this one in the multi-cooker today. I'm going to get them started and we're just going to wait. It's going to take hours, guys. It's one o'clock in the afternoon and I look to be up past midnight. In about 15 minutes, we've already got some of the liquid started in the stainless Kasori uh, pressure cooker. With the multi-purpose cooker, we have some liquid started. This one seems to be cooking slower, even though it's at a four degree higher temperature with the coated pot. This one in the stainless is already bubbling at 200 degrees. It's about four o'clock in the afternoon. I've been going since one. We're gonna see if this will keep going for several hours longer. I'm not sure how long we're gonna be doing this, but I wanted to show you what the two pots are doing. I put both of them on the slow cook high. And if you look at this one, you see it is not bubbling. It's not doing anything on slow cook high. When I changed this one to a temperature that I could regulate and put it on 212, which is boiling, I think I put it on boil and got it to 212, it overboils and it shuts down because it says it gets to 300 degrees, even though it's supposed to only get to 212. So I put it back on the highest setting on the slow cooker, which is only 204 degrees, and it doesn't seem to be really bubbling at all. So we may have to do something different here shortly. And that is the multi-cooker. On the pressure cooker, we tried it on the slow cooker on high. And again, one minute it's boiling, one minute it's shut down. So I changed it to saute put it on 212 degrees, it's fixing to kick off and I'm gonna to have to restart. But again, light bubbles, not a hot, whole lot. It might could go a little higher, but when I first turn it on, it starts bubbling like a massive bowl. And because we had so much today, we started, this is a enamel coated cast iron pan. We put these in about 30 minutes after the other two and as you can see this one is already looking clear it's cooking down it's set on simmer on my stove which is the lowest setting I have it's been steadily just sitting here bubbling like this for right at three hours or better so this one is closer to being done than the other two and the fat in it is turning brown in spots and this one is on low or simmer that's what's on my stove on the small burner on simmer to me this one seems to be doing better than the other two
All right, guys, it's about 8, all right at 8.30 tonight. We've been going since 1 this afternoon. We have 15 jars here. Most of them are sealed. Uh, Danny's still working on the last batch, so we should have at least three, if not five or six more, according to how many it fills up. Um, we'll know tomorrow whether this turns into a pretty white lard or not, but most of them are cooling off to the touch, still warm, but they're changing colors. Uh, some of the first ones he's done is really cooled off. Looks really good. Um, the pressure pot, the kasori, and the multi-cooker. We did not manage to uh, render out the lard all the way in those. They did great as far as just keeping them on a slow cooker thing and them just slowly cooking out. But they, if I tried to take the temperature up to 12, it would start boiling. The multi-cooker would shut off because it has a shut off valve. Oil would get hotter than the 212 and take the temperature on up. Um, the pressure cooker, it would stay at 212, but it kicks in and out. So it would cool off, heat up, cool off, heat up. So it wasn't doing really well in either pot for us. We put one pot on the stove. That one rendered out perfectly at a, a steady level at about one or two on our stove. And so we took things out of the two cookers, put them in the pot, and it worked fabulous. So this is what we have. Uh, if you're using a multi-cooker or a pressure cooker or a slow cooker on the slow cooker stages or slow cooker um, temperature settings, just know it will not render it to the stage where you have um, this pretty lard. It'll cook it out, but it won't cook it out to the stage that we like. So thank you guys from Deep South Homestead.